Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we thank you all of you for joining uh, here in the breakout one, uh, breakout room number two. Um, we are going to start in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to first give a chance to our judges um, to introduce themselves. So um, we have, if, if you could briefly, um, and I can unmute um, those of you who want to speak. Um, so if you could briefly uh, introduce yourself, uh, we have uh, Michael Doyle. I hope I'm saying that correct. And please um, correct yep. me if I am. That's right. Not. Should I introduce myself now? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Michael Doyle. I'm a manufacturing engineer here in the Twin Cities. I work at a nanoscience manufacturing company. Um, we make nano indenters. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, and we have um, Richard Pierce. Is Richard here? Um, I don't see him. Um, we have um, Dan Cross. Yep. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Cross. I work at Mortensen Construction. I'm in their renewable energy groups. I've been involved in wind and solar energy for the past uh, 15 years. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Um, and uh, we're waiting um, for Richard and Megan. Is Megan here? Um, so we're waiting for Megan and Richard to join. Um, so um, I'd say we can, uh, and we have our, um, we have four presentations in this first breakout session. Um, and after that, we'll have a 15 to 20 minutes break. Um, the way it's going to be is um, I would ask, uh, we will, um, so we have uh, Peter Levin in the call who is going to be promoting um, people from attendees to part uh, to presenters um, for those of you who are presenting um, and then um, you will have five minutes for three to five minutes for your presentation and then um, and then we'll have like five minutes for the judges to ask any questions um, and after that uh, we um, and then we'll have the next presentation um, I, I see that Megan has joined. Uh, Megan, um, as a judge, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Muted. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Unmuted. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Megan Voorhees. I'm director of ACARA, a program at the Institute of the Environment, works with both undergraduate and graduate student leaders interested in addressing grand challenges. And I'm excited to hear what everyone's been working on. Thank you, Megan. All right. Um, so, um, and uh, um, Peter, let me know as soon as Richard um, is here, and then we can introduce Richard as well. Um, so we go. We're going to go ahead with our first presentation. So now, how it's going to go is, I'm going to turn off my video and I'd recommend everyone else to turn off their video except for the presenters, um, and also keep your mics muted. Um, and then while the presentation is going on, I will be sharing screen, um, so the presenters can let me know when they want me to change slides, um, and I will click next whenever um, there is a change of slide. Um, all right. Um, you can obviously like um, any any people who are attendees, they can um, ask questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring them. Uh, but we'll first give a chance to the judges to ask any questions. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's that. Um, does anyone in the panel have any questions or anything to begin with? Okay. Sounds good. Um, all right, so the first presentation that we have is um, by Anthony Joseph. Um, Anthony, I would start, um, I would start uh, sharing my screen with your presentation and that you can unmute yourself and um, turn on your video and we'll go from there. Okay, sounds good. Um, right now it's telling me that I'm unable to start my video, but as long as the audio is good, I'm willing to work around anything. Oh, there we go. All right. Can every 
Um, let me know when you've got my presentation up, and then I can I can start. Good. All right, All right. We can start. Thank Hey everybody, my name is Tony Joseph. I'm a student in CBS and I, I'm an undergrad in the field of biology. And today I'm going to be talking about gene editing and sustainability. Next slide. Um, next. All right, so um, before we get into the sustainability aspect of things, let's talk about what gene editing is. So gene editing is the usage of molecular techniques to change the genetic sequence of an organism. And we can do, or we can do this with any organism as, as simple as bacteria or as complicated as humans and mammals and plants. And so within the field of gene editing, there have been two major advances within the last decade, that within nucleases and that within CRISPR-Cas9. And so both of these have allowed us to use a sort of copy-paste function or a find and replace function to change the DNA sequences of, of organisms. Um, next slide. And so I work in gene editing in plants. And as you can tell, this probably has a lot of as you can probably tell, this has a lot of implications for sustainability. So by editing plant DNA, we can attempt to feed more people, use less resources, and take one step closer to sustainability. So here at the U, my research focuses, or the research that I work on, focuses on plant model organisms. So while we aren't particularly focused on one particular plant becoming gene edited, we attempt to use a model organism to speed the process of gene editing. And next slide. And so my next slide here has a, two, a basic graphic that demonstrates the general knowledge and application that we're trying to get to. Because the problem in gene editing is that we've got a gap between accessibility and a gap between knowledge and a gap between application. And so gene editing takes time. So although we'd like to go from a lot of knowledge and applying that knowledge to applications, we have to overcome this gene editing time bottleneck. Uh, bottleneck. Uh, next slide. And so this is sort of just the same cartoon, just a bit more sophisticated. On the left here, we've got a whole bunch of plant systems and biology knowledge that we want to apply. And overcoming that bottleneck is sort of the key to the next steps in biology research. Next slide. So, on, so what I've got here are my two graduate mentors. And so on the left is my graduate mentor named Ryan. And Ryan's developed this method called Fast Track, which allows us to use gene editing at a much faster rate than before. So prior, to Ryan's work, we have relied on what's called um, tissue culture, which could take up to nine months in order to grow plants and plant genetic technologies. But using Ryan's new method, we've managed to cut that time from nine months down to two weeks, which has been a huge advancement in the field of small-scale rapid testing. Next slide. My next mentor, Michael, has, uh, has taken um, has taken Ryan's principles of speed and applied them to accessibility. So he's removed the aseptic techniques required to make gene editing possible. So now what we've turned to is sort of garage science where anybody can do this without the need for an expensive lab or high-end equipment. And their work together has landed them on the cover of Nature Biotech. Next slide. So my lab is unique in the sense that we get to see our research go directly from the lab to the market. And this is possible because my principal investigator, Dan, has founded his own company called Calix that allows us to use, various, use our various technologies and turn them into products, bring them products to market. And we've done this with soybean oil, with wheat, with alfalfa, and a couple other products as well. Next slide. So overall, gene editing and sustainability has profound implications for the future. So as we work with plants, we can make them more, more and more sustainable by re reducing disease resistance and pest resistance and making plant science more accessible. And together, all of those things can help contribute to plants that are more sustainable, that take less resources, and can uh, 
can contribute towards feeding a growing world population. Next slide. Can I answer any questions? And I think I'm a little below the five minute limit here. This is Megan. Can you talk about the dangers of doing this work? Um, what are the things the, to watch out for? Right, so um, when you're working with DNA, so DNA is sort of that base template. If you have DNA that can be, that's so, Messing with DNA can cause misfolded proteins. And the last thing we want is for dangerous proteins to get involved in the food system. The thing is um, that there are a whole bunch of redundancies within the testing system within markets to help sort of mitigate that risk. So the Food and Drug Administration requires our companies and our, our labs to submit like all sorts of biochemical profiles and testing. This is not something we get to bring to market easily. So a lot of redundancies are in place to sort of reduce that risk. That, does that kind of answer your question? I, mean, I don't know a lot about your field, but I can certainly name times where the FDA has approved things that later we had huge regrets about. So I wonder about as the sort of our own professional ethics and what you need to do or your lab needs to do to sort of constantly be watching for negative repercussions. Sure. Um, to that, I would say uh, that's a fair point, and I think that inherent in, in all sorts of different fields, we see, um, especially food-related fields, we see areas where, where um, food and um, food-related industries have to be careful regarding the safety of their products. And so, like, um, I used to work in a meat department, for example, and we'd have to clean, make sure everything was extra clean and we had to make sure we were doing going through septic de technique. Um, and the same principles are applied in the testing of our products. And I know that that while that doesn't directly answer your question, it I can there are I'm not intimately familiar with the, the techniques that we use to in, ensure safety, but there are numerous um, reports, profiles and studies that scientists do in order to make sure that a, a final product is safe and usable for the for the public. I know that's a kind of vague answer there. It's good to sort of constantly watch for right. what yep. might be the long-term effects, even though short-term it has positives. Mm -hmm. and keep yep. watching for those because it'll make the product better. Mm -hmm. Do other judges have any questions? Uh, I've got a question. Did you say that um, you actually edited plant genes? If so, which plants have you edited? Um, yeah, so we do we do work with a whole host of plants. So the so the the um, model organisms and plants are Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a it's a common weed, and we use that because use by modifying plants such as Arabidopsis that have common genes with everything else we can start implementing those changes into other, other more specific, slightly more challenging organisms to do that with. And then, um, and then yeah, there are a lot of organisms where, um, where we've, uh, a lot of plants where we've managed to gene edit it as well. So when I mentioned my PIs, my uh, principal investigators company, they do a lot of gene editing in soybeans. And so soybean oil, for example, is, um, has a lot of polyunsaturated fats. So when you're using soybean oil to fry things, polyunsaturated fats can be a, a complicating factor in, in, using, in using it as a fry oil. So what we did is we went in and we changed the genes that allow us to change the oleic oil content, which is the oil that we extract from soybeans. And we can make uh, soybean oil healthier with a longer fry time and with a, a much reduced danger of um, dangerous byproducts than by using the typical chemical method to ch make that change from polyunsaturated to monounsaturated fats. Cool, thanks. All right, in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, all right, so we the ne next we have Anushre Ramant. Uh, Anushre, am I saying that correct? Yeah, it's Anushri Ramnath. 
Anush Ramnath. Okay, um, Anushri, I'm going to share my screen with your presentation now. And um, okay. Hello. Yeah, you can you can start. Uh, so I have already recorded and sent it as per the instruction. I am Anushri Ramnath, PhD candidate with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Nasara Twin Cities. I'm here to present before you my work on implementation of two converter with integrated magnetics for residential solar applications. What's the significance of the problem? There's increasing demand for electricity generation, which directly translates to increased reliance on using renewable energy sources. To facilitate the same, there is need for cost effective and efficient converters. That is the power electronic systems that facilitate the integration of renewables with the grid. Also, there is lack of a definitive analytical basis for the design aspects of these converters, which makes the whole process complex. In order to address these aspects, this work builds on designing a converter based on the analytical basis design, parameter estimation aspects, and also building of a analysis-like design tool to facilitate the same. The targeted application domain is the residential solar installations. Motivation. The concept of zero net energy is becoming familiar day by day. The first step is taken by the state of California. That is, they have enforced that the development of zero net energy buildings for all new residential constructions should be accomplished by 2020 and all the commercial ones by 2030. When I say zero net energy buildings, the amount of energy generated in a building using renewable energy sources should be greater than or equal to the amount of energy consumed in the building. And we all are aware about the effects of climate change. Solar energy can directly help combat climate change. Typically, 40% of the total electric sector sales can be harnessed just by using rooftop solar. This is the best available option for a sustainable tomorrow. The United Nations has set up the Global Goals for Sustainable Development by 2020, and this work directly addresses five out of 17 of the set goals, specifically the sustainable cities and communities, affordable and clean energy aspects. Coming to the proposed converter design, the current at the photovoltaic end needs to be completely ripple free in order to eliminate the need for the filtering capacitors. This whole setup helps design a compact system with high step up ratio and helps maintain the operation of the PV panel. Based on the analytical basis and equivalent modeling aspects, some of the ideal conditions of design are theoretically derived. The following conditions are the ones that are obtained for two different proposed topologies. Coming to the simulation of these aspects, the electrical and magnetic components involved are co-simulated using a good simulation platform called Plexen, and the following results are obtained. In order to understand the benefits, if we compare it with the conventional topology, uh, we see that the ripple current and in input and output side has been reduced significantly in the integrated magnetics topology. Also, the ripple current and the input has been reduced with the coupled inductor topology. The efficiency has been consistently increasing as compared to the conventional topologies. The same similar simulation results are validated using experimental setup, and it seems like the hard experimental results are in close synchronization with the 
simulation results, which is very promising for commercialization of the product. Some of the highlights of the study include the comparative study that has been accomplished, successful reduction in current ripple, which was a huge aspect in order to increase the longevity of the system, and an analysis-led design tool has been built for parameter estimation. The metrics can be compared, and it is found that the losses have significantly reduced, which helps in improving the performance metrics as seen by the results. In conclusion, along with improved efficiency, longevity of the system is enhanced by reducing the ripple, and the overall cost of the system has been significantly reduced. In order to help the research endeavor grow, the parameter estimation tools have been developed successfully, and the simulation results and experimental results are in sync. This further enables the development of equivalent to microinverter by designing the first stage, that's the highly reliable and efficient converter stage. Other interesting possibility is to be able to use this for standalone applications like smart grids and storage applications. Thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you for presenting, um, Anushri. Um, I have, I'm sorry for the little blocks in there. We're also trying to figure out Zoom. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, if judges have any question, can ask. Anushri, this is Megan. Um, Megan. If I were to walk out of my bedroom, which is so weird, we're all in our different spaces, and told my eighth grader what you were working on, what should I say to her? I'm sorry, could you please repeat it? Uh, if I was to describe to my eighth grader, a 14-year-old, mm -hmm. what your project is about and why it matters, what should I say to her? So currently, as we know, the solar panels uh, have a great potential. They last for typically 20 to 25 years. But then there is some power electronics which converts the sunlight into usable form of power. At this point, there is a lack of, a lack of reliability aspects for that system that makes the longevity of the system really, really less. So typically that lasts for anywhere between five to 10 years, making it extremely painful because we've already invested in this whole system and to keep the system running, we'll have to issue maintenance or replacement of parts time and again. This not only involves cost, it also includes downtime. This work directly ad uh, addresses this problem. So the prototype that I have built is making this concern less prominent uh, by the fact that it is making the system more longitive. Currently, based on the analysis and the parameters that we have taken care of, uh, we've been able to increase the uh, longevity of the system up to about 15 to 20 years, which is double the time of what is existing in the uh, existing commercially. Also, in order to address different aspects, uh, we have addressed some of the theoretical aspects as well. So in order to build these, uh, we, we have also addressed the gap by introducing a different analytical tool which actually helps design these with ease. So based on the specifications, you'll be able to design all of these easily as well. And it is commercially viable. So we are looking for uh, ways in which we can commercialize this product. Thank you. We can have I've one got more a question. question. Um, how much does it impact the efficiency of the system? So the good news is uh, we are not compromising on the efficiency or the cost of the system. Not, it is more compact than the current system. So if we see the actual size of the system, it is 3.3 .3 inches by 3.7 inches. That's, that's the size of the whole system uh, that we have built. Also, in terms of the efficiency, we are doing better than uh, what it is at this point. Uh, but we're not compromising on it. So if we see the two different topologies, there are isol there's an isolated topology which serves as a normal string type inverter setup, or there's a non-isolated topology which can, which can be used as a micro inverter. So typically for every solar panel that can be used. Compared to the conventional ones, we have actually notched up by one or two percentage uh, in terms of the efficiency as well. Okay, cool. All right, with this, we'll move on to our next presentation. Thank you, Anitri. Um, so next we have um, Katie, uh, Bernardo, and uh, Carly. Uh, I believe Katie and Bernardo are here. Um, and uh, um, 
uh, you guys have a video that I will be playing for you. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. All right, let me keep that open. Meanwhile, if people are closer to a window, you can see that there it's snowing. <sighs> but it's good still. All right. Okay. Thank you for Okay, um, let me know if this is, if you see uh, the screen, right? Cardi, is that? Yeah, we're able to see it, and that should be the right video. Okay, all right. Okay. Thanks, I'll start it now. All right, thank you. We are with Advocacy for the Boundary Waters, and we are working under the Institute on the Environment Undergraduate Leaders Program. My name is Carly. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm Bernardo. So basically the reason that the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness needs advocacy in the first place is because um, right now it is under the threat of mining um, taking place within its watershed. So the area, um, the watershed where water flows into the Boundary Waters is not protected from mining. And there's a Chilean mining company called Antofagasta that is um, hoping to mine there in the near future. And if this were to happen, um, the sulfide ore copper mining would pollute the pristine waters and it could very much so damage the outdoor centered economy. Uh, our goal, um, it is to uh, create a path where U of M students can advocate and um, be involved with the boundary waters uh, protection. And this would be through collaboration, through um, students and having a clear path for activism, uh, tabling at the university, and also meetings with representatives. We also wanted to show this beautiful picture of the Boundary Waters because personally when I went to the Boundary Waters for nine days, I was struck by the beauty as well as the ecosystem. There are no telephone, walk no telephone cell towers there and it's gorgeous and you have to have a permit to be able to go there. I found out that it was under threat, and so I've wanted to do a project ever since. And so thankfully, thanks to the Institute on the Environment, I met Katie and Bernardo, and we talked about this and decided that not only us, but tourists and business owners, nature goers, and environmentalists are all invested in this gorgeous place. So knowing where to start with this project was difficult. At first, we had just wanted to like, meet with rep representatives on our own, but then we realized that a lot more people are passionate about this issue. So we thought our time would be better spent um, creating a path where we could um, help other students and facilitate their journey as they get involved with advocating for the Boundary Water so that we can make more of an impact through um, more people. And uh, this area generates uh about $913 million um, in revenue every year. And it supports uh, the economy and the families that live in the area. Uh, according to a Harvard study, 18,000 jobs are provided in this area and the mining would endanger the economy that's mostly based on um, outfitters uh, and uh, tourism. Moving on from the issue, we wanted to talk about the solutions by giving a project update. And so some actions that we've already taken since fall semester, as well as future plans in light of coronavirus. Yeah, so basically our project um, was centered around helping resurrect the student organization. So through 
um, undergraduate leaders, we were able to connect with another student who wanted to resurrect Gophers for the Boundary Waters, which was an advocacy org on the campus last, last year. And I became one of the board members for, now it's called um, Boundary Waters Campus Activists. And so we wanted to participate in like collaborating to bring that back together and reform that group. And then through that group, we wanted to open up tabling opportunities as well as meeting with representatives um, so we could talk to them so they know how important the issue is for college students at the U and everywhere. Um, and then going forward in light of COVID-19, plans have changed a bit. Um, as a student org, we weren't able to accomplish all that we wanted. We weren't really able to organize meetings with representatives or tabling across campus because we had just started going, um, just started, got the club going when um, school was canceled. So it, as a project, we want to continue supporting and we are planning right now on creating social media platforms um, so that we can like at least support it virtually um, while we're all quarantined. And then we would like to continue working with it next year. Uh, also, we want to collaborate with different groups in the university, uh, like the Vices for Environmental Justice, Environmental Student Association, and the Outdoor Club, uh, which all uh, have uh, manifested their interest in helping out with this uh, issue. And also, um, we, we had the plan um, uh, to outreach for the capital, so if the concern for coronavirus lessens um, by May, we wouldn't tell them to call them or email them, uh, mostly representatives and decision makers to find out um, who opposes this bill uh, against mining or in favor of mining. And this will all continue and translate into next year when all three of us are gonna pursue planning to run for officer positions in the Boundary Waters Campus Activist Club if we're not already because Katie is right now to maintain our leadership of this organization and keep it going. Thank you for listening and we're excited to continue our project. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any um, questions for us? I got a quick question. Um, so let's say, uh, we're not successful in preventing them from starting the mine. Are there any sustainable ways that they can um, prevent affecting the boundary waters? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I know, so in what I have read about the issue, um, they say that they're very um, dedicated to making sure that there is no leakage and that like the um, pollutants stay confined, but according to like past experience that hasn't really been the case so they are very um they are trying very hard to make sure that it is as like um as clean as possible and not going to be damaging but the ideal situation would just not have mining in the watershed to eliminate that risk right Does that, that make makes sense? sense yeah bernardo did you want to add in oh uh, well the the pollution uh, is um also affects the air quality not only the water quality. Yeah, that makes sense. This is Megan. Can you talk about how you're um, partnering with existing organizations? And I had the same question that showed up in the chat box. So like with Save the Boundary Waters campaign, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, towards the end of last semester, we partnered or well, I joined Gophers for the Boundary Waters, which we then like is now called Boundary Waters Campus Activists. So through that organization, we're partnering with um, Save the Boundary Waters campaign because um, we've been talking to a couple people who work through that campaign and they've been like a really good resource. And we were going to right after spring break, try to like have them come in and give like little workshops on tabling and um, on like talking to representatives but then of course that was postponed. So we're planning on connecting more with them next semester um, through Boundary Waters Campus Activists to like teach the students who are involved about like tabling and um, advocating for the issue. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, so mining is a heavily uh, regulated industry. Have you looked at existing policies that uh, you feel have some shortcomings and things that you might work with um, legislature and uh, various commissions to change the policy? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Bernardo, do you have anything? Uh, well, uh, we, uh, um, I've, I've seen uh, like different uh, attempts to change policy from what I've uh, read and uh, uh, it's really, it's really hard uh, because it has to play differently for every mining company that tries to like, get involved. Uh, but yeah, uh, so far uh, we're trying to broaden our, our community, our constituency, and uh, we'll see uh, what happens. Yeah, yeah, I know for me personally, I need to know more about policy specifically. Carly is definitely like, um, the per like she's in our group more knowledgeable than like me personally about policy. Um, but yeah, I do need to like educate myself more about specific ones. Thank you. Um, okay, so in the chat, okay, thank you. Yeah, we're, um, we're gonna have like, before we move on to another presentation, we're gonna have like a few, like uh, less than a minute for judges, if you wanna like finish up your scoring. Um, and then we're going to move on to, uh, meanwhile, if people in the, um, who are attending, I want to ask more questions, you can do that. All right, um, thank you to Katie, Bernardo, and uh, Carly for your wonderful presentation. We are going to uh, move on to our next presentation now. All right, which, um, so Ashton Pill, yeah. is that right? Yeah. All right, Ashton. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, you can start. Okay, so hello everyone. Today I will be presenting on saturated buffers and their importance to sustainable agriculture. First, I will present on some of the issues that the agricultural world is facing in terms of sustainability, and then I will move on to how saturated buffers work and how they solve those problems. Next slide. One of the major issues surrounding the sustainability of agriculture is loss of biodiversity, which refers to the variety of plants, animals, and microorganisms above and below the soil within an ecosystem. Planting the same few cash crops, such as corn, wheat, or soybeans, over the area of several hundred acres creates poor habitat for many animals and doesn't allow other kinds of plants to survive due to competition for nutrients. This creates a loss of biodiversity that is leading to the eventual extinction of many native plants and animals. Next slide. Another major issue is water pollution caused by the use of fertilizer. When it rains, water seeps into the ground and into a tiling drainage system, which is essentially a series of pipes running under a field that controls the amount of water in the soil of that field, which you can see in the upper photo. 
The water then travels through those pipes carrying the nutrients, most notably nitrates, into a body of water, usually a river or stream. You can see that in the bottom left image. Excessive amounts of nitrates can lead to more serious problems such as low levels of oxygen dissolved in the water. Severe algae growth then occurs, which blocks light that is needed for aquatic plants to grow, which is the reason why many of the lakes across our state and the entire Midwest experience severe algae growth. This brings us to our current events issue. Next slide. All of that nitrate then travels from across the entire Mississippi watershed, pictured below, into the Gulf of Mexico. When the algae blooms and seagrass die, they decay. In the process of decay, the oxygen in the water is used up and this leads to low levels of dissolved oxygen in that water. This, in turn, can kill fish, crabs, oysters, and other aquatic animals. This area of death is called the Gulf of Mexico Dead Zone, an area of about 7,000 square miles where little to no life can be found. This region is pictured below. Now, how can we solve these problems? Next slide. One way is through saturated buffers. Saturated buffers are a sustainability option that remove little to no land for production, require little maintenance, and do not affect crop yields when placed in ideal sites. They have four main components. First, a drain pipe. Secondly, a water control structure. Third, a distribution pipe. And fourth, a vegetated buffer. The tile drained water is directed into the drain pipe. That water is then diverted into the perforated distribution pipe where it is slowly pushed through the vegetated buffer. While crossing the buffer, denitrification occurs, which is a microbial facilitated process of nitrate being converted into nitrogen gas. Nitrate uptake also occurs within the plants in the buffer. Saturated buffers have shown to be extremely effective at removing nitrate, where an average of 42% of the nitrate load is removed. The amount of nitrate removed can increase if longer distribution pipes are laid. The more water that can permeate into the buffer, the more chance there is for denitrification to occur. Next slide. So this is an aerial shot of a saturated buffer. Um, here it is easy to make out the vegetated strip and it just shows how little land is taken out of production. Um, now let's see how they affect specifically sustainability. Next slide. The loss of biodiversity and water pollution we addressed earlier both work against the sustainability of agriculture, as strict regulations will have to go into effect to try to prevent further damage from both problems. But luckily, saturated buffers could work towards fixing those issues. Um, first, water pollution will be directly decreased due to the denitrification that buffers create, as we discussed earlier. Much less of the nitrates from fertilizer will enter the watershed, increasing overall water quality. Next slide. Saturated buffers increase biodiversity by providing habitat for a wide variety of animals and allowing a place for native plants to grow. This picture shows a great example of the biodiversity a buffer can create. Trees, shrubs, and grasses all thrive in the buffer. Next slide. So if you are a farmer or know a farmer, please learn more about saturated buffers as they are a great step into creating a sustainable agricultural system and are extremely cost effective as they are only about $3,500 and local soil and water conservation districts often grant almost the full cost of installing one. If you want to learn more, the USDA has the whole page dedicated to saturated buffers led by a team at Iowa State. Thank you. Ashton, do you have thoughts about um, what incentives need to happen for farmers to, to do this? Um, so right now, one of the issues that um, we're working on is the fact that farmers um, often do not want to try to um, take these new initiatives into place because they're not used to it and it's just something um, out of the ordinary that is starting to develop. So um, it, it's not in a lot of fields right now. Um, so local soil and water conservation districts um, provide great incentives. They pay for mostly the whole cost of installing one and they'll do a whole, um, they'll research your entire field plot so they know exactly where to put it and um, um, to 
get the least amount of land, biggest incentive is the cost, and it's usually free for most farmers. Um, so I'm looking in the chat now. Um, the first question is, what sort of vegetation works best in a saturated buffer? And, and there hasn't been a lot of research behind that yet. Um, I know um, at Iowa State at the National Agriculture Laboratory that they have there, that's one of the issues that they're trying to um right is a hill software that removed and then the second question is currently how widely is this used in mn or the us so um Personally, in the county that I live in, I know that there is um, not a lot of farmers using this, but in Iowa, it's a big thing right now, mostly because of the laboratory that is there. So they're trying to um, basically um, initiate it in Iowa since that's where the laboratory and most research on this project is going on. Um, so right now in Iowa, I believe 60% of farmers have saturated buffers in their fields. So once more research occurs in Iowa, um, we'll be able to start to move it to other states at a faster rate. Are there more questions for Ashton? I've got one. Um, is there any type of crop that farmers could grow in that buffer zone? Um, mostly, probably not, because there's a lot of piping that has to go into place right along the vegetated strip. So it wouldn't allow many different um, crops to grow as well as they could in just the regular field part. Um, but because the saturated buffer is so small and takes a little land out of production, um, usually that's not an issue with them wanting to plant crops in the buffer. That makes sense. All right. Um, thank you, Ashton, um, for presenting. Um, we, so we're now at the end of our first breakout session. Um, and uh, our, our second breakout session is going to start at 1 p.m. Um, we have the same judges um, for the second session as well. So we have about like 30 minutes of break in between for you guys to go stretch um, and come back to this. Um, we'll have a uh, We'll have five presentations in the next one. And um, just a reminder for everyone who is presented or who is uh, here uh, as attendees, at, um, um, at, at 2.30 p.m. we will have our um, panel discussion and that will be in room one. And uh, I will put up a slide with the Zoom link, but um, it's actually z.umn.edu slash um, Expo room one um, and there are currently other breakout sessions going on and there are lightning talks going on in that room um, but after like two after two two fifteen two thirty we will be moving on to our panel discussion and then closing remarks over there um, so thank you to all the presenters um, if people have any questions I'm sure you can um, like still chat here and ask questions in the chat box. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we'll be taking a break and I'll be okay.